And then I became um, a PhD candidate at the Health Sciences Institute at the University of Debrecen. Uh, right now I'm a fourth year student there and I am in the last sem semester. Uh, in during my journey, I studied many associations of dental diseases and diabetes mellitus, uh, failure of dental implants and diabetes also. Uh, right now, currently at the PhD, I am uh, studying more about the burden of diabetes mellitus in Europe. And uh, currently, we're doing research in the inequalities of non-communicable diseases in Europe. And we include the dentalism and diabetes in these non-communicable diseases. And in order to do all of this, uh, I've been experienced in systematic reviews and meta-analysis, secondary database analysis, and also clinical cohorts and trials. Uh, today, we're going to talk about systematic reviews. And I'm pretty sure we all have seen uh, pyramid like this, where we can see all the types of studies based on the quality and how supported they are in the community. Uh, in the, at the base of the pyramid, we can see that the expert opinions and background information are at the base of this. Uh, and then we have different levels and we get to systematic reviews where we are going to focus today. Um, so, Talking more about systematic reviews, uh, we do this type of studies to seek, evaluate, and synthesize research evidence. And the difference about this and the conventional reviews is that we need to follow established guidelines for review processes. Uh, this systematic review, they should be transparent syn synthesis of empirical results derived from primary research, addressing questions usually related to health issues, interventions, and policy decisions. Uh, there is a rising trend of professionals, researchers, patients, health policy makers to incorporate the outcomes of systematic reviews in their decision-making processes. And um, we should uh, focus on doing a comprehensive synthesis of usually safety, effectiveness, diagnosis, etiology, and prognosis. Uh, and the systematic review, it should be capable of generating more precise overall estimates of interventions, effects, and variations of effects across diverse patient subgroups. So how to start a systematic review? Usually, I like to divide these in three steps. Uh, the first one being planning the systematic review, which I think is the most important one, in which you should be very cautious to include everything and design everything that you're going to include in your systematic review. The planning part should take as much time as we need to, because after that, it's very difficult to change things in the methodology of your systematic review. So the planning part includes creating the team, designing the study, to, uh, uh, selecting the databases, um, the eligibility criteria, everything. The execution, um, it's, I, I usually say it's the fun part of the systematic review where you get things done. So it's when you, you and your team um, get to screen the studies, select them, um, extract data, uh, generate uh, many different contents uh, in order to synthesize everything. And then the last part, it's the easiest one, but it's not easy at all. It's the reporting of your outcomes and the results of your systematic review. So at this part, uh, we're going to write, we're going to create images, graphs, uh, tables, of course, submitting, and if you're lucky enough, uh, publishing your uh, study. So talking a little bit more about the planning, uh, the first step is forming the team, which is very important, and I'm going to talk uh, more about this later. Uh, selecting the topic, of course, uh, conducting a comprehensive search of prior reviews, uh, because of course we don't want to repeat studies that have been published already, uh, formulating the research question and organizing information within the protocol. So about the team, uh, this is an important phase because I can see that 
many systematic reviews have been published with only one author, for example. Uh, every time I see that, I think um, with myself, how was this? How how can you follow guidelines of systematic reviews with only one author, with one only one reviewer doing everything? How can you uh, screen and how can you discuss conflicts if you have only one person on your team? So we should always take care and look for the correct people to be introduced to your team in order to do a good systematic review. So the first reviewer usually is responsible for conducting searches, uh, reading and screening articles, and writing the systematic review. review. Uh, usually it's the first author, but of course it changes according to the team. The second reviewer, uh, they have almost the same tasks as the first reviewer. So they are going to conduct the searches, read the articles, uh, do the screening of abstracts and full text, and of course, assist the first reviewer in every task they need. The third reviewer, uh, usually it's responsible to be the judge when you when you have conflicts between the two, the, the first and the second reviewer. So this person, I usually advise people to get a third reviewer who is uh, specialized or at least have more experience in the topic that you choose because they're going to be the judge in the conflicts when the second and the first reviewer disagrees in, in a topic or in regards to including or excluding a paper. Uh, then we have the expert. Uh, usually this person is uh, specialized or have more experience in the topic of the systematic review. So this person uh, should advise the other reviewers or the other members of the groups of the group on the topic they chose, on the research questions, on uh, the studies they should include or exclude, on how the topics are important to groups and everything related to that. This person, uh, they don't need to be uh, expert in systematic reviews, but actually in the topic chosen. And then we have the research coordinator. So this person should be specialized expert or at least have more experience in systematic review uh, methodology. So this person is going to advise uh, according to the study design, how to conduct the screening, the search strategy, the inc including studies or excluding studies uh, uh, on how to, to write the paper on the sections of introduction, methodology, results, discussion, conclusion, and all the important things the methodology should comprise. And then we have the other members. So this design, was based on the way things were done before. So usually journals, uh, a few years ago, they would accept uh, systematic reviews with a maximum of six members. But luckily right now, we don't have these rules anymore. So uh, we, we can include as many people as we need to. Usually the journals, they accept that. So the other members um, could be a librarian or someone who understands about how to, to develop a search strategy, a consumer, and in this case, we call a consumer of a systematic review, someone who needs this topic to be uh, more studied or they need the outcomes in order to uh, make decisions in, in the practice. So it could be a dentist or a professional, a health professional, a policymaker. So these people will be able to advise on what is important and what is not that important. And also uh, someone who can do the, the statistical part if you're including the meta-analysis and many other people who can advise on the important topics of the systematic review. Uh, so, okay, the next step is searching for prior systematic reviews. So, uh, as I said before, we don't want to repeat something that has already been done or published, um, which doesn't mean that we don't need to improve that or maybe it's too old. So how can you search for previous studies and their protocol and if they've been published or not? Uh, I would say the first step is to search for pre prior 
systematic reviews that have been published. So the best place to search for these is PubMed, but also you can do the same in Google Scholar, for example. After that, if you don't have any studies published, maybe you have protocols submitted. So you should search in Prospero and the Cochrane database of systematic reviews. Uh, if you search for, for those uh, databases, you will be able to see if someone submitted or if a, a protocol has been accepted. And then you can check all the details for that systematic review. And then you have uh, other databases, they are not that famous, but they can, of course, help somehow. And I put an example here is the database of abstracts of reviews of effects. And this one is specialized. So depending on the field that you are working on, maybe you have that different databases in which you can search for protocols. Uh, even uh, currently, Prospero, of course, is the, the, the most famous but you also can uh, can find protocols registered, for example, in ResearchGate. So it depends a lot on where the author is going to submit that. Okay, so if you found a, a study that has been published or a protocol that is uh, ongoing that is being studied, what do you do? So the first question is, is it outdated? So, and I cannot put a rule here. So I cannot say to you guys like, okay, so if it's three years old, you can conduct another systematic review. I cannot say that because it depends on the topic that you're studying. So if you're studying something that you have updates or studies being published every week, for example, uh, this time frame is it's uh, smaller, so you can maybe do another systematic review even in one year or six months or something like that. But if it's something that it's already been established and you don't have many updates, maybe you should wait three or five years to do another systematic review. So it depends. Uh, was it conducted correctly? So in order to check that, you can check the study in PubMed or the protocol in Prospero and check all the methodology section and all the details. So if you find gaps or flaws in the study, you can um, create a study design that is improved. So of course you can do another systematic review in this case, even if it's not that old. And of course the third question is about the gaps. So for example, if a study was a systematic review was published, but they don't perform subgroup analysis. So maybe you can uh, create another systematic review for that. Uh, so all these studies included in those uh, systematic reviews, in the, the ones that you found, they should be screened. It doesn't mean that you should include in your systematic review. But those studies, they are going to help you to create the, the search strategy, to find keywords, uh, to understand the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So those studies will be very important. And of course, the knowledge that you gain from those reviews uh, will help you to formulate a research question. And of course, to design your own systematic review on the topic in an improved way, let's say. Okay, so the research question, it should be interesting, answerable, and innovative. It should be clear, focused, and well-designed. And it can arise from previous research or from a clinical practice or for, from a problem that you find in an environment. And of course, it should be useful for a broad number of people. So it, it's very hard to, to publish something or to generate a systematic review in which the results would not be useful for the community. Okay, so I'm sorry about this, guys. I don't know how to hide this. Okay, I'll put it here. Uh, so, okay, framing the research question, and this is very important because usually uh, in most systematic reviews, we use just one framework but we should learn that we have more than one framework and they, they could be applicable for many cases. So usually the framework used in systematic reviews, there it's the PICO uh, in which you include the population intervention, comparators and outcomes. And also we have a different PICO which uh, include the population phenomenon of interest and the context. Uh, usually PICO is used in 
most systematic reviews, which is okay, but they should be focused on effectiveness and assessment and experiential investigations. We have different frameworks for different things. So I'm just going to show you guys a f like a few more, but I can later send some studies that they present different frameworks so we can use in our research. So for economic evaluation, we have Peacock, which includes population intervention, comparative outcomes and the context. Also for prevalence and incidence, we have CocoPop, which includes only condition, context, and population. Uh, for diagnostic test accuracy, you have PERT, which is population, index test, reference test, and diagnosis of interest. Uh, of course, as I said before, we have many more frameworks, and I guess I can uh, send you guys some, some studies that present more frameworks. Uh, here, I would like to show you guys an example of my own. So in the left side, it was a systematic review about the survival of immediate implants in, in diabetic patients. In this case, we use PICO and that's okay. Uh, and then the population uh, were comprised of uh, people with diabetes. The intervention was immediately loaded dental implants and uh, the comparator we had two different comparators in this case, controls. Uh, we had non-diabetic individuals, or we had a different one, uh, conventional loaded dental implants. And then the outcomes, which is so survival, success, and other things. So in this case, it's okay to use PICO. But then I, I want to show you guys another systematic review of my own, in which we studied the burden of type 2 diabetes uh, in European Union. And in this case, we included incidence, prevalence, mortality, and economic analysis of the burden of diabetes. So we had two different frameworks because we had two different research questions. The first framework that we used here was CocoPop because it was focused on incidence, prevalence, and mortality. So in this case, the condition was type 2 diabetes. The context was the incidence, prevalence, and mortality. And the population included people living in the member states of the European Union. The other question was focused on uh, economic analysis. So for this one, you use Peacock. So the population included people with uh, type 2 diabetes. We didn't include any interventions or comparators in this case, uh, so it was not applicable. Uh, the outcomes, they, are, they were direct costs, indirect costs, and other economic analysis. And the context was a geographical uh, context, uh, the, the European Union in this case. Uh, so just showing you guys that we ha we do have other options and we, we should use them to systematic reviews. Okay, so talking ab about the preliminary search, uh, it should be established based on the chosen framework and it will serve as a foundation for a definitive search strategy and is uh, tailored for each database. So of course, the search strategy should be adapted for different databases. Uh, in this case, for example, I, I chose the PICO one, uh, in which the population were uh, ch uh, child, children, pediatric, pediatric. So we should try to include as many keywords as we uh, need to. Uh, and then uh, I'm just showing you uh, some example here. Uh, so the preliminary search should be conducted on PubMed to identify at least five papers on the topic for initial reading. Uh, and again, this is not a rule. This is the way me and my team, we do things. So at first we should do a preliminary search. And if you find at least five papers that could be included in the study design that you want to perform, so they will help you to design the study and uh, maybe they will be included at the end of the proce process. So these this papers should be examined and the significant keywords that can enhance your search strategy should be included. Uh, during, during the initial reading, inclusion and exclusion criteria should be identified and included in the study. And based on this pre preliminary reading of these papers, uh, the search strategy strategy should be constructed. 
Okay, so talking about the databases, uh, it's very important to select the correct databases for each study. And again, I'm going to show you guys how I do things, but each field, uh, if it's health related, if it's law related, or if it's um, related to pharmacology or biochemistry, it depends. Um, maybe you have some specific databases uh, specifically designed for the, that field, and they should be included in your systematic review. Uh, and this, if you have a person, it, maybe it's not a librarian, but you have someone who understands about search strategy, this part is very important. So usually we use five main databases and then the systematic reviews that I've done before, I included the PubMed, Scopus and Web of Science. Uh, and the specialized ones, I, I, I have some examples here. So Sinhal, PsychoInfo, SpeechBite and Pedro, they could be included as specific databases. Uh, the great literature is very important and how you include that in your papers also could also be tricky. So in my previous systematic reviews, we included Google Scholar, OpenGray, and ProQuest for dissertations and thesis. And usually they are done, this search and this inclusion, it's, it's a little bit different from the, the conventional databases. And that is one of the reasons that why Prisma created another flow charge to include this paper of course, in the beginning, but they will be included in your study at the end of the process. So that is the great difference of the Prisma data, uh, the Prisma flow charge that I'm going to show you guys one example here. Uh, but of course, the great literature is very important. And in the previous studies, we didn't include as many studies as we found, because for example, in Google Scholar, you, you can maybe in, one search, even when well designed, you can have maybe 10,000, 40,000 results. So sometimes we define a, a number, for example, 100 papers, the first 100 papers of Google Scholar will be included in the systematic review. Uh, that's, that's usually how uh, our team we, we do in regards to great literature. Uh, the expert consultation, if you have an expert included in your systematic review, and of course, uh, this should be planned beforehand uh, if you're going to include experts and if they're going to be able to indicate studies to be included in the systematic review. And of course, checking the reference list for uncovered articles, which is very important. So. Sometimes, even when well-designed, we can miss studies. So it's very important that we check the reference list and check all the papers to see if they could be included in our systematic review or if we're going to continue only with the ones that we included before. Okay, so this is one example of the flow diagram of 2009 and uh, comparing to 2020. So in the left hand side, you can see uh, uh, another uh, example of my own. And this one was for the bur burden of diabetes in European Union. And here it was the flow diagram of 2009. You can see that it's very simple and it's not very detailed. And that's one of the reasons that they created the new flow diagram. So here in the, the right hand side, you can see that we have much more details on each database that we included, uh, all the, the exclusion um, reasons, uh, all the different analyses, uh, and you can check all of that. Uh, and actually, this is an example. I, I, I'm just showing this example because in this case, when we submitted, we, we have done the, the systematic review according to the prism of 2009. But when we submitted the paper, the, the reviewers, they requested us to, to manage our systematic review into the new Prisma flow diagram, which could be very annoying, but we found a way to adapt that. So that's why you can see the gray literature here. But if you're following the correct methodology of the new Prisma, 
you're going to see that the prisma, uh, the, the gray literature is going to be different in this case. So here in the right side, you can see the, the, the other methods of including papers. So in this case, usually the gray literature is asked to be put here. So you have a totally, totally different uh, screening process for the gray literature. And then you're going to include those papers at the end of the process. So it's a little bit different, but I guess it's good. It's, it's, it's more detailed. Uh, you, you can uh, have a different analysis of how that conventional databases are different from gray literature. And you can compare their, them and include all the studies at the end of the process. Uh, okay, so some additional information, uh, which is very important to define the reference manager software that will be used. And I'll talk uh, a little bit more about that because I think it's really important. Uh, establish how that collection will be conducted. Ideally, it should be carried out by the first and the second reviewers, but of course, other members could help also. Uh, choose the tool that will be used to assess the risk of bias of the included studies. And and usually it's the Joanna Briggs Institute, Amstar, um, CASP, and you have many others that you can include. Uh, also to present strategies for composition or non-composition of subgroups and the conduct or non-conduct of meta-analysis, depending of course on the data that you have in your study. Uh, clarify how the certainty of evidence will be assessed. Uh, plan the journal that you're going to uh, submit your paper and uh, compile all this information in the protocol. Uh, so talking about the protocol, um, the protocol should be registered on an online platform or database such as Prospero, uh, and it allows the protocol to be accessible to the public, promoting transparency, which is very important in systematic reviews. Uh, and also it enables everyone to understand the research question and methodology with details, uh, and also to avoid duplication of efforts. Uh, the protocol publication is one of the items on the Prisma checklist, and many scientific journals value this protocol availability, considering it uh, essential for publication. So I don't think I've seen a systematic review published uh, in a high-level journal in which they didn't have a protocol published somewhere. Uh, and it, ideally, the protocol should be registered soon after the corrections by all the authors, and they all have to agree uh, on the protocol details. And of course, sometimes you need to change a few things, which is okay. And the Prospero, it allows you to change a minor things in the protocol, but it should be made only before data collection. So after you start data collection, it's very hard to change anything in the protocol or the study design. Uh, so talking about the protocol registration, uh, Prospero is the most famous database for prospective registration of systematic reviews. And usually it's health related, and but you can also have topics uh, such as public health, education, law, international development uh, that are usually related to health. Uh, it was established in 2011 following the introduction of PRISMA. Uh, uh, and after this publication, the, the amount of registrations of protocols it increased very much in the, the previous years. So right now you have thousands of, of protocols registers that. Uh, and it contains ongoing, completed, and published systematic reviews. And one thing that is very important is after you publish your systematic review, um, it's very, it's requested that you go back to the Prospero uh, website and you let them know and you mark it as a published systematic review. And usually the authors, they don't do that, which is very sad, but it, it, I guess it's good to promote that. Uh, as I said before, Prospero is the most widely um, uh, used protocol. And you have other ones such as the Open Science Framework, Figshare, Campbell Collaboration, and even ResearchGate. So 
I would say the most important thing is to register your systematic review protocol somewhere accessible for everyone. But some journals, they, it could be really tricky and they can request that your systematic review, it's, it, the protocol is published in Prospero. So it's, that's why you should um, choose the, the, the journal before or during the planning phase. So you can check if they request that in Prospero or you can do this in other platforms. Um, and the, the, we started to talk about the, the registration of protocols in other databases, mostly after COVID because it was very, they stopped analyzing in detail the, the protocols of studies that were not related to COVID. So a few years, from a few years ago, until now, sometimes you can submit a protocol and it will be accepted without someone reviewing the protocol. Uh, and that's why everyone started talking about other, other, other websites or databases. And I think that's really important not to, to hold all the information in just one database. Uh, so in addition to these registrations, you can also publish your protocol in the format of uh, a paper. So a lot of scientific journals, they do publish protocols for systematic reviews, which is also amazing. Uh, so usually, though, not usually, but those are the questions that uh, you can check in the Prospero website when you're uh, submitting your protocol for the systematic review. So you have everything there, the intervention, you have the information about yourselves, uh, the, the country, the language, the inclusion, exclusion criteria, outcomes that you're expecting, the control groups, you have everything. And that's amazing because when you're designing your systematic review, you can go to Prospero, search for prior systematic reviews and check all this detailed information about them. And then of course you can find gaps or methodological flaws that you can improve in your research. Uh, and that's that's why I'm, I'm talking about how important is transparency in systematic reviews. Uh, so the search strategy, uh, of course uh, we have some ways of facilitating that and the the, the formats of using the, the, in the search strategy and or quotes not uh, they help a lot so sometimes we check systematic reviews that use only a few keywords and uh, the, the the search retrieved thousands of, of, of studies, but sometimes you can see that it's better to specialize a little bit your search strategy in order to avoid extra work during the screening process. So usually when I'm, I'm doing systematic reviews with the team and we do a preliminary search to check if the search strategy is good enough, we can see that we retrieve many papers that, has, that they have nothing to do with the, 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 the issue. And then we, you can specialize a little bit more your search strategy to avoid including all of those papers in your in your screening process. And of course, you save time, you save energy, you save a lot of things. Uh, okay, so using MESH uh, terms, MESH, they are medical subject headings. Uh, uh, and they, they, they are used for indexing articles for PubMed which is very nice because using MESH terms, you can find all the, the papers that are related to the topic that you want. So it's very important to select the correct MESH terms uh, to be used in the search strategy. And I put an, an example here that you can check in MESH terms. If you search, for example, cancer, you can see that the corresponding MESH term in PubMed is neoplasms. And then if you click on that, you can check that you have many other MESH terms related to that uh, first original term that you searched. So it means that every time in PubMed you search a, a MESH term, you're going to retrieve all the results related to the other uh, terms that are related to cancer, for example. Okay, so talking about the reference manager, which I think it's very important here, uh, we have many managers that we can use in a systematic review. 
And here I want to differentiate a little bit because some reference managers are used during the whole process of screening, selecting, even designing the, the Prisma flowchart. And some of them are used only during the writing part. So to do citations and reference lists. So here I'm going to focus a little bit more in the ones that I used. So I hope I can help you guys with my experience. Again, this is not the right or wrong things to do, but the ones that work for me and my team. So the reference uh, manager, uh, when you, uh, why, why you have to use a reference manager? So when you do a systematic review, a cons considerable number of references are usually acquired with a well-defined search strategy. So you can have many, many papers and you have to manage them somehow. And the, the reference manager helps to organize and standardize all the studies obtained in the primary search. Uh, also, it can facilitate the reading of studies and screening and removal of duplicates. Uh, usually there are computer programs available online or for downloads, such as softwares, uh, and they allow you to import uh, references from different databases. Uh, they enable the organization of library into folders, subfolders, removal of duplicates, attachment of images, and most importantly, PDFs. And of course, they allow you, uh, they allow the automatic creation of formatting uh, of citations, accommodating various uh, citation styles in order to write the paper. Uh, some of them also permit the direct or indirect sharing of libraries with third parties, which is very important. So let's check the pros and cons of Covidence. And after, of course, I, I, I don't want to show you only the, the, the topics here, but, but after here, I'm going to share, share my screen to show you uh, the actual software and how I use them for systematic reviews. So talking about Covidence, that's, I would say it's the best one. Uh, it's the one that I like the most. And a few of the pros, uh, the Covidence platform, it uh, simplifies the screening process, uh, allowing us to update the references and to do the screening. Uh, based on inclusion and exclusion criteria, which is very important. Also, it allows us to, to include multiple reviewers and to do everything in real time. And you have, and Covidence allows you to have a great um, teamwork, let's say. Uh, it integrates with other reference managers such as EndNote, Zotero, and Mendeley. And uh, you have the option of uh, automating the, the, the duplicate removal, which is very important. Uh, you can customize the, the, the website based on your systematic review. So I guess it's amazing that you can include the, the, all the inclusion and exclusion criteria or design the, the, the website to, to allow you to do everything that you need in regards to that systematic review. Uh, there is a transparent reporting, reporting, which I think is really important because you can do the whole systematic review using Covidence, and after that you can download reports. So Covidence creates the Prisma flowchart for you based on the whole process. So it's automatic. Uh, also, Covidence, it's a very well studied, you have a, a whole team uh, taking care of, this, of the, the platform. So you have many updates and it's very easy to communicate with them, which, which is amazing. So every time I have a problem with Covidence, I just send them an email and they sometimes they even fix the issue within a few days. Uh, the really not good, the, the con in this case is the subscription fee. Uh, it can be really expensive. So that, that could be a problem uh, for many people or many teams or universities. Uh, some universities, they have, uh, subs you, you can have a subscription for free, let's say, but of course it depends on the, on the institution. 
there's a learning curve. So confidence is really e easy to use, but it takes some time for you to understand how to manage your systematic reviews. So, so for the reviewers, it could be really easy, for, but for someone creating and customizing the website, it could be really hard. Uh, there's a limited offline access. So uh, it, it, you should be online to, to perform the screening here, uh, of course, and the connection should be good. It, it, it's a really heavy website, so it cracks sometimes. It's, it could be hard if you don't have a, a, a good internet connection. Uh, the automated process could be could include some errors. So a few parts of the process, such as duplicate removal, should be manually checked or double or double checked. Uh, and there is a limited support for uh, non-randomized controlled trials. So for example, observational studies, it could be really hard to customize the website for that. Okay, so now about Rayon, it's not, I don't think it, it's used enough, it's uh, famous enough, let's say, but it's uh, really good software. And I used that for a previous systematic review and it was amazing. So, and th for this one, you don't need to pay a fee. So that that's one, uh, Ryan is one that I really like and I suggest people to use. Uh, so it's really easy to use. Uh, you, you can do an efficient screening. You can include uh, members to screen, to check everything. There's a collaborative workflow. So it, it, it uh, again, it allows you to have multiple reviewers uh, doing everything in real time. Uh, uh, there's an integration with other uh, reference managers such as EndNote, Zotero, and Mendeley. Again, we have a, a automated duplicate detection, but it should manually double checked. Uh, and there is a mobile app, which is amazing because if you're going somewhere, if you're on a travel, you can take your cell phone and screen of papers. Uh, there's a restricted screening phase. So it's really focused on the screening process, but for example, that extraction methodological assessment, it could be not really good for that. Uh, limited customization. So you're limited to, to include topics of your systematic review in the software. Uh, again, it depends on you being online. Uh, there's a curve for administration administrator so if you're managing the systematic review it could be hard for you to to manage the website and there is a limited reporting capability so if you're finishing your systematic review and you use rayon for that maybe you should uh manually check everything in order to report that and and note i don't i use this for one systematic review and i don't really like it uh the note desktop usually you have to pay for that uh, but the web version is free, but it's limited for systematic reviews. I think for for citations and reference or to write the paper, it's amazing. Uh, I, I love EndNote, but, but for the whole process of the systematic review, I don't think it's the best one. Uh, so uh, it does have the integration with that, the databases, the compatibility with other softwares. You have many citation styles. You can customize according to in, uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. But again, we have limited advanced analysis. So of course you can use for citations and for screening process, but you cannot really use for other things. Uh, it depends on the desktop application, or if you can use the web version, it's kind of limited for a lot of things. Uh, and in order to collaborate with your team, it could be really tricky in real time, at least. So I'm going to show you, I, I'm not sure if about the time, if I, if I have a few minutes, right? Yes, yes, we still have 30 minutes more. You can continue. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, just a second, I'm going to share my screen. Again, screen share. Okay, so this is the Covidence website. Um, the aesthetics of it, it, it's really nice, but let's check the bad part, which is the pricing. 
Uh, so as you can see here, it could be really expensive, mostly when you want more reviewers involved in your systematic review. Uh, but of course you can check with your university or um, check if you can have a discount on the subscription. So how does it look like? So when you open uh, uh, COVID and you can see that it's really, it can be really slow to, to upload things, to update things because it's really heavy. So let's check uh, the systematic review that we are conducting right now. Uh, here you have a section for references. So this is the place that you can import references, remove duplicates and do everything related to that. Uh, then we have the title and abstract screening. In this study, we have more than 18,000 studies and you have the option of resolving conflicts. In this case, I am a third reviewer, so I have, I, I can resolve conflicts. And for that, we have meetings with the other two reviewers. Uh, and then you can uh, screen the papers. You have the option here to continue screening. Uh, and then for the abstract phase, you can see the title, all the information here about the paper, the abstract, and you can choose no, maybe, or yes to include the paper. In the resolve conflict section, you have uh, who voted for that. Uh, in this case, it was Rita and Federico. In order to have to, to avoid bias, and uh, we don't have the votes here, so I cannot see who voted yes and who voted no. So we, we should have a meeting in order for the three of us to check the abstract again and uh, reach a final decision on that. Uh, so let's go back to the home page. And then you have the full text review. Uh, in this case, we can check here the title, uh, the option to include or exclude. And you have here the PDF uploaded. So you can open the PDF, check that, and select include or exclude. If you select exclude, we designed the platform for that, of course. We have the, in, the exclusion criteria here, which is amazing because you can customize everything. Uh, let's check the next phase, which is the extraction and quality assessment. So uh, in this case, you can uh, come here and you have two options, data extraction template and quality assessment template. And this is all customized, so you can put whatever questions that you want to put here for the data extraction and quality assessment. So it's up for you, it's up for you to decide everything. Okay, so then you have a study here and you can, for example, begin extraction. Let's see what we get. Uh, here we have the PDF in the left side, it's loading. <laughs> so here you have the PDF so you can uh, check everything and respond to the questions in the right side. So here we designed the extraction form so we can have everything, the country in which was conducting the methods that co-approval, the study design, everything. You have everything that you could possibly need in the future uh, in this data extraction form. And also at the same time, the same reviewers, they should, be the, they should do the quality assessment. So in this case, we have already the questions here and it's yes, no, uh, cannot determine, not applicable, not reported. And it depends on the quality assessment form that you choose for your systematic review. Okay, so going back a little bit more, here you have uh, the options of exporting information and you have the Prisma flow charge which is amazing, but it's actually the Prisma flow charge of 2009. So maybe we should uh, manually adjust that in order to publish the paper. Uh, here, for example, you can see the studies excluded in the full text uh, uh, phase, and you can see all the reasons and how many studies were excluded in each phase. Uh, Okay, so I know that I'm a little bit short in time, but I'm going to show you the Ryan platform really fast. Uh, they made a revamp really 
I guess it was in the previous year. I'm not sure, but how this is how it looked before when I used Rayon for my systematic review in the past. Uh, so here you can see your systematic reviews that you're working on. You can set the blind off or on, depending on the phase that you are. Of course, we blind off after finishing all the screening process. And the Ryan platform, oh my gosh, I'm not going to, I forgot my login. I'm going to show you guys later, or I can send you some screenshots later. But the Rayon platform, uh, they done a revamp, revamp in the design of the platform. So it's much better right now. You can understand in a much simpler way uh, how to screen the papers. But the, the really big problem about Rayon is that you can only use it in the screening part. So for example, in these screenshots, you can set all the keywords here in the left side. And uh, the here in the middle, you can set the exclusion and inclusion criteria. You can see the abstract and then you can select the paper. After the whole process, you can blind off and check if you have conflicts with your partners. But the only problem is that Ryan is focused on screening process. So you can do the abstract phase, even the full text phase, but the data extraction and the quality assessment, it's kind of hard to be performed here. Um, but I guess it's a great platform you, and you can use other platforms such as EndNote to complete the process or even Google Forms or different kind of forms to, to complement Ryan and you don't have to pay for that. Uh, so yeah, now I'm I'm able to uh, answer questions and I really appreciate your attention and the invitation to talk to you guys about my experience. And I hope you liked uh, everything that I said. I'm going to stop my sharing. I didn't check the chat during this time, so I hope I didn't miss anything important. Yeah, but that's, that's all right now. No, you don't. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very insightful session. And uh, me personally, I learned a lot of things. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, in, in the meantime, I can give the stage to Opera. She can share the questions. I would like also to our participants to join us in our social media platforms, as well as Author Aid, if you would like to be a part of the community. And also, uh, there will be a feedback uh, link. Uh, we really appreciate if you could just fill that form so we will be able to improve our sessions and our webinars. Uh, Abrar, are you here? Can you take the stage, please? Uh, Abra, you are muted. Can you unmute yourself, please? No, we still cannot hear you. Okay, until you try to fix your mic, um, I will try to share some questions. Okay, the first question is, where do we draw the line between systematic analysis and literature review? I'm not sure if I can, I understood this question. This yeah, is yeah. I guess we have maybe three questions about that. Let's, uh, about the differences of a literature review and a systematic review. And I think the questions, they're not that much focused on which one is which, but how to differentiate that. And, we can see that many studies have been published 
with the title of systematic review. But again, when you check the paper, it didn't uh, really follow the guidelines. Maybe you have just one author, which at least for me, I don't think a, a systematic review should have just one author. Um, they didn't follow a protocol. Uh, you, they don't report a search strategy. Uh, the screening process was not performed by two reviewers at least. Um, you don't have a framework, for example, and I think the framework is really important, but because in order to extract data, the data extraction is based on the framework. So as I, I showed you guys in the Covidence platform, all the questions, they are based in something. So the questions about the data extraction questions in regards to the inclusion criteria, for example, you should be able to extract outcomes directly related to the the inclusion criteria. And those are the things that make a systematic review to be a systematic review. So uh, if you follow the guidelines and usually the Prisma guidelines, they are really strict about what you should follow, uh, then you have a systematic review. Uh, that's why many papers, when you check them, you can see that the first thing that they say in the methodology was, we follow the Prisma guideline. This is a way of telling us, the readers, that this is actually a systematic review. But as researchers, as uh, uh, students or professionals or consumers of systematic reviews, we should be able to understand the topics of a PRISMA guideline and check if the systematic review actually included those, those topics. And that's the most important part. So I don't think a systematic review is a systematic review because the author said so, or because it's in the title, or because you have a methodology section. It's, it, that's not it, you know? You should be able to understand what the Prisma guideline requests. And if the, the systematic review that you're assessing, uh, if it has all the topics there. Uh, when you are experienced enough to read a systematic review and understand if they followed most of the topics of the Prisma guideline, you will be able yourself to perform a systematic review and design a systematic review, a good one, let's say, which is a very different from a literature review. Uh, and I, I wouldn't say it's better or worse, but because a, a literature review is very important to present us to a new topic or to give us ideas of what we need to talk about in, in systematic reviews. So I guess all these study types are important, even literature reviews, but we should be able to differentiate them regardless of what the author says or what the journal says about them. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, I'm really sorry I wasn't able to have on my microphone. Uh, thank you so much for this lecture. It's really good. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let's proceed to the next questions. Um, what is the minimum number of the team for systematic review? Yeah. Okay. So as I said, I guess I, I'm really <laughs> picky about this topic. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of annoying because I really like to have a, a, a complete team. You know, so when I'm performing the systematic review, I like to have people that can help me either to to in the screening process. So this per, usually I'm the first reviewer. That's a, that's why I'm saying that. But usually I, I I I want to have a good second reviewer, someone that understands how a, a systematic review works, and this person will be able to screen to do the whole screening process with me, the abstracts and the the full text part. And I also like to have a third reviewer who is an expert in the topic that I am studying. Because when you have a, a meeting in order to resolve conflicts between you and the second reviewer, you don't have, you don't, you don't, you don't want to have someone who's like, okay, guys, I am not sure because I'm not really uh, experienced in this topic, in this topic, but I guess this study should be included. No, you want to have someone that it's able to tell you, okay, so guys, you have many papers about this and usually the papers, they include these topics and which is important in this topic is this, this, and this. So this person will be the judge. They will resolve the, the, the conflicts with you. But actually this person can also be an expert in methodological in methodology of systematic reviews. So you don't need another person for that. This person could also be really good with search strategy. 
So you don't need another person for that. So I would say that a satisfactory systematic review, you have at least three people, uh, three members in your team. First, second, uh, first and second reviewers, and a third party who will be able to manage all the other things that you need. Uh, but to be very honest with you, I really like to work with more people. And in the current systematic review that we are doing, as I, I showed you guys, we, ha we have more, we have almost 20,000 papers to assess. So we have, I guess, five pairs of first and second reviewers. And so we have at least 10 people. And then we have my supervisor, who's an expert in the topic. We have someone that is an expert in uh, systematic reviews. So right now, I guess we have 17 people in the, the team, which is amazing because the systematic review can be done really fa in a fast way. And we have many people to discuss. Of course, when you make this decision, you have to think about the meetings because it's really hard to have meetings with the whole team to resolve the conflict. But imagine how good it is to have a meeting to discuss the conflict with 10 people who knows about the topic and who, who are participating on the screening process. So it's amazing. I think you can rely more in the systematic review when you have more people to, to contribute. And I guess if I can suggest something is to include people from different institutions or different countries because the I hire a really... I, I was shocked to see to go out of Brazil and go to Hungary and see how different they do research there, how different uh, the systematic review conduct is there. And right now we have people from different countries and different universities. So the meetings, they are amazing, you know, like everyone gives an idea of how they do things, how different things can be done. Uh, even in the framework that I explained to you, usually in systematic reviews, you just use the PICO analysis. But we included people from Canada and, and Brazil who are experts in, in systematic reviews. And they presented to us many other frameworks that we can use. And the research, it helps on the research question, the search strategy to include the correct papers, you know. So that's my suggestion for you guys. If you can work with people from different parts of the world, different universities, do that. And if you can include more people in your study in a way that you're not going to complicate the process, but in opposite to that, to help the process to be faster and have more quality, do that. You know, it, it's going to be an amazing experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, actually, there is another question. Um, uh, people asking um, about the types of included study in the systematic review. Uh, they should just include uh, randomized control trials or they could uh, mix the studies. And what about the risk assessment? Is it the same for all types of studies or not? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the inclusion of studies, it's a tricky uh, topic because it actually depends on the topic that you want to study and the problem that you have in your hands. So uh, for example, usually in dentistry, a uh, problem arises from a clinical observation. So if you want to study something that you have, you want to compare different treatments, for example, or different interventions, the best way to do that is including only a randomized clinical trials. But sometimes and many times you want to, for example, the, the study that I showed you guys about the burden of type 2 diabetes in the European Union. We didn't want to check any kind of interventions of or, or uh, risk, risks or anything like that. We just wanted to study about the incidence and prevalence and mortality. So in this case, we only included cohort studies. And that was the best decision because the cohort studies, they are made for you to understand how the incidence and prevalence work. And in order to, uh, to, to have a more a broader, uh, broader knowledge about this topic, we are conducting another systematic review 
uh, in the same topic, but right now we are uh, studying the interventions. So it's almost the same uh, study design, but for the second one, we are only including interventional studies. So that's what I'm saying. Uh, it's not because a systematic review only included observational studies that it's less important than the, the, the one that included interventional studies. They are made for different study designs. So, and it depends on the problem that you have in your hands or the question that you have or the research question. Uh, also the, the risk assessment and the quality assessment, it completely depends on the type of study that you're going to include. So again, giving an example of the study that I showed you guys before, uh, we included incidents, prevalence, mortality, and economic analysis. So in this case, we had three different quality assessment and risk of bias, and they should be used for those different uh, type of studies. So that's a good and a bad thing at the same time, because when you do, when you include different types of studies in your systematic review, you have uh, an extra phase during the process, which is to, to have someone could be a second and a first and second reviewer to classify the study type. So in usually this part comes before the data extraction. So after you included all the papers that you needed, after the screening part, you have a, an extra uh, work here that is defining the study design of each study. And of course, this part should have first and second reviewer and to have meetings to decide the conflicts. Uh, and this part will be important for us to generate the, the data extraction form because the data extraction form depends on the study type that you have, also the quality assessment, also the grade analysis. So uh, if your systematic review allows you to include different types of studies, you should have this extra part and you should apply the correct forms uh, that extraction and quality assessment for the different types of studies. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you very uh, much. Let's uh, hear some voice. Um, Sorry? Abimbola, you can speak now. Actually, um, some people wanted to speak to ask, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm sorry if I'm uh, pronouncing the name wrong. Please correct me. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. Okay. I only have one question, which is thank you for the presentation. I was really nice hearing, I mean, knowing, hearing from you today. My question is on the reference manager mm -hmm. that you mentioned. I'm asking, mm -hmm. if you are doing one systematic review article, manuscript, how do you make, how do you, do you make use of more than one reference to, yes, you restrict yourself to one or two? That's my question. Can I, can, uh, uh, can you please uh, repeat only the question? I understood everything else, but only the question about the reference managers. Oh. It was freezing your voice. Can you please repeat that? Reference managers. Yeah. Yes, you had. Yes, you had the reference manager you gave us during your presentation were Mendeley, Ednodes, Ryan, Covidence, and the likes. I'm asking in one systematic review manuscript, do you make use of all of them or you are used to just one or how do you make your choice of which one you will use? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you make use of one, one mm -hmm. of this? Many man, I mean, a reference manager you 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 highlighted in your presentation, or you make use of two or three or just one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So I guess it depends a little bit on the team and the study topic, for example. Uh. So in the previous study that I showed you guys about the burden of type two diabetes, we mm. wanted to use Covidence because. That's a great platform, you know? Everyone knows it's a great platform. You, you have everything there. You can do the whole process there. But then when we started the process and I tried to create the, the that extraction form, it was impossible, you know, because it's 
that that extraction form is limited. So if you put too much, too many questions there, it starts to, fr to freeze and to give you issues, you know? Mm -hmm. And for the, imagine extraction data about incidents, prevalence, mm -hmm. mortality, and direct costs, indirect costs. It was a huge, it was a huge form, you know? Uh, and then we uh, we talked to the team and we decided to use EndNote, which is the one that I really don't like that much. Okay. But you can use EndNote for the screening <laughs> process. And after that, you can use EndNote for the citation part, the writing part. So what do you use in the, in the middle? What do you use for that extraction and for the methodological assessment form? you have to, to use okay. another one, right? So in this case, mm -hmm. I created a Google form. And of course it's free, so it's amazing. If if, if your university uh, doesn't give you the, the, the money or anything like that, the support. Uh, so you'll use the Google form to create a really huge form. Uh, actually I created three, four forms, depending on mortality, incidents, prevalence, and economic uh, analysis. So imagine that using Google form to a systematic review, but it works just fine, you know? And I also use Google form to do the quality assessment form. Uh, right now we are using Covidence because we are uh, st doing a systematic review on interventional studies. So imagine it's much easier to create a Google form because in this case, uh, the questions, they will be mostly related to the intervention and to the control group or the comparator. So you don't have that many questions. So I can use Covidence to upload the, the studies. Sorry. sorry. Okay. I'm okay. Go on. Sorry. Sorry for the disruption. Okay. No problem. So in the Covidence platform, you can do from the baseline onto the end point of your systematic review. So you can upload all the studies there, remove the duplicates, do the screening part. It is going to generate a Prisma flow chart for you. You can do that extraction, upload PDFs, do the quality assessment, everything. But then in order to write the paper, you need another reference manager. So in this case, we're going to use probably Mendeley or EndNote. So I guess, if you can, if you can use more uh, reference managers, it's totally okay. And sometimes you do need use using more and associating them. And that's why they talk to each other. Let's say they have this compatibility. Uh, Covidence with EndNote, Mendeley with Rayan. You you have this integration. Let's say, and it's totally okay to use them and also to use other things such as Google Form, as I said before. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, no. Thank you. Thank you so much, doctor. Uh, actually, there is a question from YouTube, uh, which is, what are the criteria to be used to judge you have reached a saturation point in screening papers? Reached a, a what? Saturation Sorry? point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in screening paper. A saturation point? Yeah. Mm, let me think about it. I guess maybe the question is about the number of studies to be included, probably. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, and I'm going to answer this with another example. Uh, and I think the preliminary search is really important for that. Of course, you don't have, you don't want to have a systematic review with 400 papers, you know? Uh, it's really hard to discuss, and I don't think it's really useful when you include that many papers in your systematic review. Uh, of course, the numbers of papers that you include in your systematic review depends on the topic and the field that you're in. For example, uh, the systematic review about dental implants in diabetic patients. It was a really specific topic, and we only included three papers in the meta-analysis. But it was a really important paper because it was the first one in a long time. You know, uh, but in the other hand, for example, in the burden of diabetes in European Union, it's it's not really a novelty. And that's the reason I cannot include only three papers, you know, so you have to be able to manage that. But during the planning phase, so the preliminary search strategy uh, will will uh, be able to tell you a mean, a mean number of papers that you're going to include at the end of the process. 
but sometimes you're going to miss that you know it's it, it's you, you cannot uh, reach the final number of papers of the inclusion during the preliminary uh, search. So what we're, we're doing in the current paper that we are doing, the systematic review about the interventions in type 2, in type 2 diabetes in European Union. Uh, we included, I guess, almost, it was a little bit more than 300 papers as in, included in the systematic review. It was a really difficult scenario. Like, what do we do now? Do we put more exclusion criteria, for example? Do we remove countries? What do we do? But I don't really like doing those things because we, you are actually uh, changing the methodology of your papers, of your or systematic review during the, the journey, you know? So what we did in this case was to split the results at the end. So we are uh, dividing the interventions according to, for example, physical activity, then you have an outcome. According to diet, then you have another one. So we are going to divide the systematic review in five systematic reviews, depending on the focus, on the, the groups, or on the intervention for that. So we are able to report the whole thing uh, we don't need to change anything in the process. We don't need to go back to the screening process to remove papers or to change things. We just have to separate the analysis into different topics, and then you can uh, publish different studies about different things. So we have a systematic review about physical activity, another systematic review about diet. Um, but some authors, some, some study teams, they don't like to do that. Uh, because it's like you're taking advantage of, of something to publish more papers. So if you have this point of view, you can also do a different thing, which is separating your interventions, for example, inside one, one systematic review only. And that, that's what we did in the, the burden of type 2 diabetes systematic review. At the end of the process, we saw that we had a completely different results. The first one uh, associated with uh, economic burden and the other one associated with the epidemiologic burden, which included mortality, incidence, and prevalence. Instead of separating in two different uh, papers, we chose to do only one paper about the burden of type 2 diabetes in European Union. And then we separated the analysis, of course, the methodology, the, the method session, it separated from the epidemiologic one. And then we, we presented everything separated, but in the same paper, which could be uh, really fair, you know, if you don't want to take advantage to publish a lot of papers or if you're thinking about that. So you have different ways of dealing with this kind of issues, but this all should be uh, recognized or you should be able to identify all of these in the preliminary search. And that's why the, the planning part is so important. Thank you so much for sharing all these details. It's really Thank rich. You. Um, Thank you. Actually, as we reach to the end of this session, I'm giving um, the mic to Dr. Nafisa. Uh, thank you very much, Aprar. Uh, actually, I didn't expect that much of questions. It's just <laughs> very, very good. We have uh, we have even more questions, but due to the time limitation, we will not be able to cover all these questions. I shared in the chat um, question box. You can share your question there, and then we can share it with Dr. Carlos, and he can give the answers, and we can send it to your email. Uh, again, also the uh, the recording will be sent to your emails that you registered, please. You can follow us on social media. The people who are asking about joining groups for collaboration, you can also find that because we have mentor and mentees links has been shared by Upper. You can share them again where we have also a training. You can take it for six. You can be started uh, training from scratch for six months and then you will be conducting a systematic review for three months, which is in total will be uh, will be nine months. That's if you would like to start from scratch. If not, you can find people who are expert, 
collabor uh, collaborators and also researchers who are interested in your topic. You can just follow us in social media. And yeah, that's it. Uh, I'm not sure if you have any more thing to add, Dr. Carlos. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys again. I didn't expect <laughs> that many people to participate. So I'm really happy that uh, you're interested in listening to my experiences. And I want you guys to know that I am, that I know that it's really hard to be a researcher. You know, it's really hard to depend on other people. And as I said, it's really important to have a good team. So sometimes you reach out to someone and they don't respond, but you, you really want to continue with that research or I know you have many difficulties, you know, so I, I want to be able to uh, give my email address to you guys if you want to reach out to me to talk to me about something, if you have an issue, if you don't know what to do in your thesis, in your dissertation or anything like that, or if you ha have any doubts, I am available uh, to talk to you guys. Of course, it's better if you send an email so we can uh, talk in the email. Or, of course, if you want to talk in a Zoom meeting or anything like that, I am available uh, to help because I know how hard it is to be a researcher anywhere in the world. I guess we have our issues. So, and that's it, guys. I wish you the best of luck in the research that you're doing. And if I can help, I am going to help you, okay? <laughs> and thank you very much for the attention. Well, we appreciate that. Abrar, do you have anything to add? Actually, it's really an amazing lecture. Uh, I'm just yes. impressed and want to thank uh, Dr. Carlos. I also want to thank you and uh, all participants. Actually, also the questions were uh, really impressive, yeah? Well, thank you very much. Uh, last request, if you just just um, open your camera. We would like just to take a, a screenshot to share it in our social media platforms, if you don't mind. I will just try to be fast because we have a lot. <laughs> Feel free, convenient. All right, I will start the first one. You can smile, you can do any movement, <laughs> do anything crazy thing. <laughs> okay, I'm going with the second one. Now, next one. Right. I'm almost there. <laughs> yes, I think that's it. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. See a you good next day. session. Bye. Uh, please, guys, fill out the feedback form to improve our um, sessions and events according to your preference.